I, I don't know about you guys, but man, aren't those little kids cute, man? Isn't that awesome? I don't know about you, man, but if I wasn't here, I would find a way to get here. So I want to say thank you to all of our volunteers and donors um, who make it possible. Um, I, I, you know, before I go into the message, I, I just want to stop and say, man, I think some of the most important we work that we do doesn't happen in this room. It happens in that room over there with our little children uh, because we live in a world that is busted and broken and they need to know that there's a God who made them. And that there's a God who loves them and a God who wants to be a friend and a God who has a plan for their life. So if you serve or you give or you're a part of South Point, I just want to say thank you because you are making a difference in the next generation. And we will leave a legacy that will make Jesus smile. So, hey, if you'll give me two minutes, whether you're online or in the room, I want to say thank you if you're a visitor. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team. We're going to talk about something that I think applies to all of us. It doesn't matter if you showed up today and you're going, listen, I've been going to church my whole life. Or maybe you showed up today and go, hey, listen, I grew up with something other than Jesus. Like I grew up with something different. Or maybe you showed up because someone dragged you because there was a family member. Or maybe you heard there was a funny looking dude with big ears. And so you showed up online or in the room and I go, hey, this thing applies to all of us no matter where you're at in faith. Matter of fact, There's something that happens in our culture every year at about the same time that reminds us this is principle that applies to all of us. Matter of fact, there are three things. I'm going to put them up on the screen. And here's what they are. There's birthdays. This thing will remind us of something that impacts us all. There's anniversaries. This kind of principle applies to all of us. And then 4th of July. And listen, here's what's in common with all these three things that applies to all of us. They're all celebrations that remind us of something significant. Like a birthday. A birthday is celebrated not because you earn it. It's because the world became a different place when you were born. Someone should say amen, right? The world became a better place the day that you were born. We celebrate an anniversary because it reminds us of a significant event where we were single, right? And then we grab someone's arms and we go to a wedding. We look at them and say, till death do us part. And we go from single to being married, till death do us part. We celebrate that and go, man, that was a significant event. The 4th of July, I mean, we have fireworks. We do all this stuff because we say, listen, as people, we're meant to be independent and have freedom. Now, I need to have a little bit of honesty about this because the 4th of July is a great celebration. But if we can be really honest, only a portion of people got to be independent. There were some indigenous people that didn't get to be independent. There were some people of color who didn't get that. And that's why we celebrate Juneteenth, because it reminds us of this truth. That regardless of the color of your skin or what you believe, that all of us are image bearers who are made for freedom. And all these three things have something in common, and this is what they do. They celebrate something significant that reminds us that life is more than just the everyday. And the real question is, is why on every continent, why in every culture, and why in every century do do people do these things? Why is this built in to human nature? And it's because of something, listen, you didn't need to come to church. You you probably already know this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's this right here. Is that without remembrance, we drift towards the... We, we, we drift towards the trivial. Listen, can we just be honest? We got any adults in the house, right? Got any, adult, any adults? Okay, all of you just lied. Like, all of you are adults. Except for the kids that didn't raise their hand. Good job, kids. Right? Here's what I discovered about adulting. Adulting is hard, right? Like, listen, after you make the food, somebody's got to put it away. Somebody's got to do the dishes. Somebody's got to go to work. Somebody's got to pay the bills. Somebody's got to cut the... Like, right? We all have to adult. And the problem is, is often, is that we can get stuck in the trivial of everyday living and forget what... See, the reality is, is the everyday grind, the trivial of the everyday grind can cause us to forget what truly matters. And here's why this is so important, regardless of where you're at in faith. And it's because of this following statement that we're going to put up here right now. And it's this right here. When we are stuck in the trivial, it leads to existing. I mean, I bet you know someone like this. Maybe this is even you. You go through the grind of Monday through Friday just to get to Friday so you can get liquored up or hook up or go to the club or do whatever you can do because the grind is so bad. We live through the grind to medicate to hope that we can make it for another week. Come on. I know I'm not the only person that ever lived like that. Somebody say amen. And the problem and the reason that we live that way is because when we get stuck in the grind and the trivial, we just think we live to exist. But remembering significant things moves us towards living. It reminds us that we're here for more than just the nine to five and to do stuff, that we were made for something more. 
And that's why we celebrate significant things. Because when we don't celebrate significant things, we stay stuck in the trivial, so we just exist. And then we medicate and we exist some more. And the reality is, is if you showed up more online or in person, every single one of us at our heart wants to live and live a full life. And so I want you to hold on to that thought. Because here's what I know about everyone, whether you're online or in the room, is no one wants to just go through life existing. Everybody actually wants to live in life. So I need you to hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to it in a second. Hey, we're in week three of a series. We're going to put it on the screen. We're in week three of a series called this. Why does South Point Church do that? Because here's, here's what I discovered. And I know it was true of me when I started going to church. Whether you've been going to church for two weeks or whether you've been going to church for 20 years, there are times we do stuff at church that we go, I have no idea why we do that. I bet if some of your friends asked you, why do you sing in church? You'd be like, oh, they've been singing since the olden days. I just thought it was something we do. You know, like no one ever explained, like, why do we sing? And, and like, why do you have an offering? And like, so you, why do you do that? Why do you hold people into water? I'm glad that you let them back up. But like, what, what is this thing where you dunk people in water? Why do you do that? And like this whole bread and this juice thing, like, what, what is this thing? And so the reality is, is because we're embarrassed to ask about it, whether you've been two weeks or 20 years, there's some things we do at church. And here's the thing, when you don't understand the why, it becomes a meaningless ritual that we do that has no meaning. And ain't nobody got time for that. Somebody say amen. amen. Right? We don't want to do meaningless rituals. We want to show up and go, is there a God who can meet me where I'm at? A personal God that I'm in relationship with. And so that's the whole point of this. Now, so you miss week one or two, no worries. You can go to our website or you can go to our YouTube channel, subscribe. It drops every week. And you go and you can catch up on demand and watch there. Man, week one, we baptized 78 people between two services. It was awesome. It's a privilege to be part of such an amazing community of people who love Jesus and love the world around them. But why do we do this? Back to this idea of that, like when we get stuck in the trivial, we just exist. But when we, when we remember significant things, we, we remember to live. It kind of leads us into the questions that we're going to ask. We have two questions that I want to try to answer. And I think whether you're a follower of Jesus, I think it'll be important for you to want to hang out. And here's the two questions that we're going to want to answer is, is why does South Point practice communion? And communion is like we have the little bread and you take a little piece and, and then you have the little bit of juice, grape juice or wine and, and you take a little bit of that. Like what is this whole, like what is that thing that you do? Like why does the church do that? And so we're going to explain that. But then the real question should be is, is why, why should I take communion? Why should it be something that I do. Why, why should it be personal to me? Now, I say this on a regular Sunday. Sometimes I get embarrassed that I repeat it, but it's what I love about following Jesus is that you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to go to theology school. You don't need to go see some guru. Following Jesus is so simple. It's not easy. Somebody nod their head. If it was easy, everyone would be following Jesus, right? But Jesus made things so simple. That's what I love about Jesus. And there are really three reasons that they're so simple of why, why we practice communion here at South Point. And I'm just going to kind of put them up on the screen. Like Jesus practiced remembering. Matter of fact, we see in the lifestyle of Jesus where he celebrates a remembrance of something called the Passover. We're going to get that in a second. Jesus instructs his followers to remember something. So Jesus did it. Jesus taught it. And then followers... Okay, the first service was way better than you. Not that it's a competition. So let's just try that again. Followers? Followers. See, here's what I, like, like, can I, can we just, hold on, I'm going to preach here for a sec. Come on now. Listen, going to a church does not make you a follower of Jesus any more than sitting in a garage makes you a car. Right? And just because your mama, your daddy, or your grandma was a Christian doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. You know what makes you a follower of Jesus? Followers. Followers follow what Jesus did and taught. So the reason that we practice communion is because it's what Jesus did and it's what Jesus taught. Matter of fact, we see Jesus celebrating one of the greatest remembrance of one of the most significant events in the history of the Jewish people. Now, I need you to understand something. When I first went to church, I started going to church when I was about 17. I met Jesus at about 17. I had read the Bible, read the New Testament. I was locked up in Jesus, man. If you haven't read Jesus, Jesus is awesome. I grew up, Jesus was like petting sheep and he was on stained glass and he was always thin and weakly. But I started reading the New Testament and Jesus stuck up for people. Jesus offended everyone and he cared for the poor and he forgave the unforgivable and he healed the broken. And when they came to arrest him, he said, it is me that you're looking for. And they all fell down. He said, you're not putting me on the cross. I'm going, well, I like Jesus is the man. 
right? But I didn't grow up reading the Bible to read about Jesus, right? And so this Passover thing, if you didn't grow up in church, I need to explain why Jesus was celebrating Passover. It's because this Jewish people, right? They're a group of nations. They're actually called the nation of Israel. And God had promised to deliver all of humankind to this people group, this nation called Israel, except they had been enslaved and exploited and were having genocide committed on them by another people group called the Egyptians, and I don't know about you, but no one likes to be enslaved, no one likes to be exploited, exploited, and no one wants their children thrown in and genocide committed. Everyone nod your head and say amen, right? So God looks down from heaven and sees us and his heart is broken. And God who loves people comes from up, down, up there, down here so that he can make a difference. And he steps in to deliver him. So he uses this dude named Moses, right? And Moses is kind of old. Moses does all these miracles to try to convince the Egyptians that exploiting, enslaving, and killing is wrong. Somebody should just nod their head. That's wrong. But they won't listen. They're hard-headed. Got any hard-headed people here? I know I am. They were hard-headed. Even though God had showed a miracle after miracle after miracle, they just wouldn't let his people go. So finally, God does what God has to do, but he doesn't want to do. God says, I guess I'll have to bring judgment on the firstborn of the Egyptians. But God's kind of stuck in a jam because whenever God shows up to bring judgment, no one makes the grade. See, that's why at South Point we can say you can come as you are, no perfect people out, because no one's perfect. Say amen. And here's the thing. God wanted to deliver the Jewish people from the Israelites, but if he showed up to judge the firstborn of the Israelites and they would die because they weren't perfect, right? But the Israelites weren't perfect. They didn't make the grade just because of their ethnicity. Just like we don't make the grade because we show up in a building. God was like, what do I do? Because if I show up and I bring judgment, they're all going to be wiped out. And so God tells him to do something that is a picture of something that Jesus is going to do for you. And Jesus is going to do for me. And Jesus is going to do for we. He tells the Jewish people, and it doesn't tell the Egyptians because they're being hard-headed. So he tells the Jewish people, tell you what, you take a lamb and you sacrifice that lamb. And after you sacrifice the lamb, you take the blood of the lamb because life is in the blood. And, and you take that blood and you put it on the doorpost. And when judgment comes to fall, I will see the blood and I will pass over. Because something innocent has already died in your place. And see, that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus was perfect. And we don't get to heaven or get heaven in us because we're good. It's because Jesus died on a wooden cross. And when God looks at you and I, he doesn't see us. He sees the blood of Jesus who is perfect. And we get a pass. Somebody should say amen. amen. And so Jesus celebrates this thing called Passover because the Israelites lived, but the firstborn of the Egyptians died and they freed and let the people go. They were delivered to experience life and life to the full. And Jesus is remembering this most significant event that God showed up to redeem and to save his people. Matter of fact, we see this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. We're going we're to pick it up and we'll put it on the screen. It says, so Jesus said to Peter and John, go and prepare the... He wants to celebrate. He, he's, he's remembering. Listen, as a people, we need to remember the significant so we don't settle for the trivial. Prepare the Passover meal for us to eat. And when the time came for Jesus and the apostles to eat, he said to them, I very much wanted to eat this Passover meal with you. He's celebrating the Passover. He's remembering the goodness of God, how it stepped into time and space and did what only God can do. So Jesus remembered the Passover. But then Jesus does something at the end of the meal where he instructs and he teaches his disciples to not just remember this, but to do a new remembrance. And we pick this up a few verses later in the eyewitness of the Gospel of Luke. It says, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. I just need everyone to not have pity for Jesus. He wasn't tortured Brutally beaten, spit upon, and tortured on a cross because he had to. His body was broken because he loved you and me and we. And he wanted to see the hell get out of us so that we could experience heaven on the inside. So someday we could experience heaven forever. This is my body given for you. Do this in. See, communion is like this bread and this juice. It isn't mystical. It's not a magical spell. 
It's a remembrance of what Christ has already done. When you are fully surrendered follower of Jesus who said yes to him. When we take communion, it reminds us that his body was broken. And then he goes on to say, well, that's not just my body was broken. He goes on to say, like the lamb that's blood was shed. He says this, next verse. He says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant. See, you used to have lambs and animals that you would slay, but the son of God will be slain once and for all. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for, listen, Jesus didn't die on a cross for God. He died on a cross for, for us, for you, for me. He says, do this in remembrance. So Jesus remembered. And then Jesus instructs and teaches his disciples to remember. And then remember we said, followers? You almost got there. <laughs> Followers follow, right? So there's this church, this church in a Rome city called Corinth. And Corinth was pretty wild and crazy. It was kind of a port city, right? And so there's this group of Jesus followers a lot like South Point. Some people hadn't grown up in church. Some people had gone to the Jewish synagogue. Some people had come from pagan religions, right? But they had heard about Jesus, so they said yes to Jesus. And there was a disciple of Jesus. His name was Paul, but he wasn't an original disciple. He actually used to kill Christians until he encountered a risen Jesus. And he writes to this church a lot like us, and, and he's reminding them of something, and so he wants to make sure that they get it. And we see this in this letter to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, followers follow. He says, for I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord. So this is Jesus. This is straight Jesus, like not interpretation, passing on what Jesus said. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God. Then he broke it in pieces, and he said the following. And we can go to the next verse. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in... There's that word, remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after the supper, saying this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people. Agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in? So he says it twice. It's like this idea of like the reason that you do it is to remind us of something significant. When we as followers of Jesus get together in a community, because a church isn't a building, by the way, it's a group of people. Somebody should say Amen. This is just a building. What makes it a church is the people inside of it, right? When a group of people get together and they take communion, what they're remembering is that there's a God who made them and a God who loved them and a God who died on the cross. We do it in remembrance of the one so that judgment could pass over and we could experience life. And so why does church do this thing with these little wafers and these little juice cups? Well, it's because it's sanitary, number one. But there are three big reasons going back to why we do it. We're going to put them on the screen. And it's this. Well, Jesus remembered. Jesus taught us to remember. And it's, it's coming. So I'm going to prepare you. Like, get ready. You ready? <laughs> Followers. Followers. Oh, love the second service. You got to fire it up. <laughs> Followers. Follow. But then becomes the important question, right? Why should I take communion? What, what is communion going to mean to me? Like, whether you're online or here in the room. Why should I re remember communion? What, is, what, what should communion mean to me? And so, like, we've answered. We're going to go to the next slide, which is I kind of answered the question right here, which is what is communion? Why do we practice it? But, like, why should you take communion? Why should I? Why should we do that? And there are three reasons. And listen, each one of these reasons, I could spend a six-week sermon series on each of these. Um, and so nobody got time for that right today. It's Father's Day. We all want to go eat some steak and burgers, right, all the fellows out there. And if you're vegan, that's great. There's just more hamburger for me, right? The three simple reasons why I think communion is something that we should partake in. It reminds us of three things. And here's the three things that communion reminds us of. And we're going to put a bunch. It remembers God's unconditional love. We remember God's unselfish love and remember God's unfailing love. You see, God's love is unconditional. See, here's what I need you to know today. It doesn't matter what you did last night. Because some of us, we were out last night. You know who I'm talking to. <laughs> right? And you're kind of here. You're kind of in the background just hoping nobody sees you or the pastor doesn't make eye contact. Maybe you're online. But listen, I need you to know God doesn't love you any less. Matter of fact, did you know God can't actually love you any more than he already does? Because here at South Point, we have a little saying we just stole from somebody else. Anybody that would die for you is for you. Like anybody that gives their life for you is on your side. 
You see, God loved you before the foundation of the earth. God doesn't love you for what you do. God loves you for who you're meant to be. You are meant to be the daughter of the Most High or the son of the Most High. Now, anybody got a birthday this month? Anybody got a birthday? Raise your hand if you got a birthday this month. Woo, happy birthday. Great. All two people. That's great. Not a lot happening. Okay, anyway. I got two daughters. My youngest daughter, she has a birthday coming up in August. And as I was thinking about how to describe God's unconditional love, I realized that no family has what I call a birthday scorecard. Like nobody has a scorecard on your fridge for January when your kid is bad. Oh, you failed that month. No one has one that says February. Oh, you didn't make February, man. You only got like eight more months to go, 10 more months to go. You better get it in gear. No one has a scorecard where you get to the birthday month and go, whoop, you really weren't good enough to have a birthday this year. And if you're that parent, we need to pray for you after the service. (laughs) You know why we don't have birthday scores? Because you don't celebrate someone's birthday because of what they've done. You celebrate the birthday because of who they are. They are your child. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God doesn't love you because you got it right or you showed up or you voted for the right party or you worked this or you gave that. God doesn't love you for what you've done. God doesn't love you for your deeds. God loves you for the destiny to be his son or daughter. You were designed to be in a relationship with the creator of the universe. God's love is unconditional. But here's what I know about love. Love is a two-way street. And God will never force himself upon you. You must receive the love of God found in a person named Jesus. Remember God's unselfish love. I don't know if you know this about Jesus, but Jesus didn't really want to go to the cross. And one of the most amazing scenes in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying and he says, God, if there's any other way to redeem humankind, I do not want this. Because for the only time in eternity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit will be separated. God the Son will bear the weight of the sin of the whole world, mine, yours, and everyone's for all of eternity. And he's like, God, if there's any other way, I don't want to go. But not my will, your will. And Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to give his life as a ransom. And you see, when we take communion, it reminds us not only that we loved unconditionally, but that genuine true love is. At the first service, I think I offended him. Because I think the church thinks that we can win through politics. I think the church thinks we can win through theology. And the problem is it's not our politics or our theology that will change people. They will know we are Christ followers by the way we. That's the words of Jesus. If you're offended by that, just take it up with him. But love is unselfish. For Jesus says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give. I got two, two daughters. I remember when they were little. This is probably a decade or so ago. We got two snowstorms in St. Mary's back to back. One was about two feet. One was about 18 inches. In the neighborhood I live in, there's not a lot of place to put snow. So they took all the snow and they put it in these big hills. And my daughters and I and my wife were out. We're all decked out in our snow gear. And we saw these giant hills and we started climbing them. And somehow it turned into a game of king of the hill with my little kids. And as parents, it's the greatest thing to play king of the hill with your little kids because it's the only time you can kick them in the dome piece and it's okay now I did it gently so don't anybody go away from here and told me my pastor told me I could kick my kid in the head that's not what I'm saying but when you're playing king of the hill and you know you're pushing them and they're fighting them and you know as a good dad I would let them grab me and I'd pretend like I'd fall and I'd get to the bottom right and then mom or one of the other girls would get up and it's funny because when I was at the bottom instead of dragging the girls down every once in a while I'd act like I was trying to grab them but as a good dad I would push them up so that they could get their turn at the king of the hill and you're going what does this have to do with communion and God's unselfish love because the world believes that winning at life is being on the top of the hill kicking keep people in their heads so that they can be down. And Jesus said there's an upside down where we get on the bottom and we get behind people and we push them to our Savior no matter the cost to us. So when we take communion, it reminds us that we live a different way. We live an unselfish love. And when we take communion, it reminds us of God's unfailing love. I wish I could tell you that if you say yes to Jesus, that you get a car, you get a car, and you get a car. That's Oprah, not Jesus. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. 
In this world, we have defects. In this world, we have dysfunction. And in this world, we have death. And even Jesus didn't get a pass from that. Say amen. Amen. Jesus ended up on a cross being tortured. And he died and he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But the story wasn't finished because the kind of love that God displayed, not even death and dysfunction and defects could defeat him. And the power of God rose him from the dead and the tomb is empty. And you want to know the best news, no matter the dysfunction or the defects or the death that you've experienced. Maybe it's the death of a dream, a death of a marriage, a death of a family member, the death of something that you'd hoped would happen on this side. I got great news. When we take communion, it reminds us that the tomb of Jesus is empty and that someday our God's going to come back and he's going to make all that is wrong right. And he'll wipe away every tear. And there is no dysfunction or no death that will define you. Instead, the power of God. I used to work for a geo company, and we used to do concrete slabs for hotels that were 20 story highs. And I had what I thought was a pretty unimportant job until I went to our shop one day. I was doing these things called concrete samples, these big, like two foot long by almost a foot round, like these concretes. And as I poured the slabs, I'd have to take some off the truck and make these cones. And I would bring them to the office, and I never saw what they did before. And they said, Well, we tested them. And I said, Well, can I watch? And they said, Yes. And they would take these giant cylinders of concrete, and they'd put them in these crushing things to see if they would hold the weight because you don't want to find out if the concrete can hold the weight when you're having a wedding party on the 20th floor. Someone say amen. So they would crash them to see if they would hold the weight. And the great news is the empty tune in a risen Jesus means that he can hold the weight of your life. And we celebrate communion. It means we're loved not because of what we did yesterday or today or if we showed up, but because God is good. And it reminds us that we live differently. We have this unselfish love that we reflect the love of Jesus. And remember, no, no matter what happens in this life, we win. Somebody should get fired up. I got two challenges as I close the message because my timer's in red. If you're online or in the room, and you've never said yes to God's unconditional, unselfish, and unfailing love, I want to ask, would today be the day? It's so simple. You just admit, God, I don't make the grade. I need you. B, would you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he died and he conquered death, not so you could play religion, but so you could have a relationship with him, and then commit. It's where we simply, no, 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 don't take my TV. I need one more quick second. You're doing good. You're doing good. Our team's awesome. They're doing great. Commit to following Jesus. And then my second challenge is if you're here and you're fully surrendered, would you participate in communion? Because here's what communion is. We're going to put it up on the screen. This is why I needed this for one last second. It's this. Communion is remembering. Communion is where we stop and remember the greatness of God's love found in, not in a building, amen. Not in a political party, not in a church organization, but in a person named Jesus. That's what it's about. And it realigns how we see and live in the midst of everyday living. We take communion, we're reminded that there's something greater than trivial, that we are sons and daughters who are meant to have a purpose to bring up there, down here. You can now take the TV. So under your seat, you'll find communion. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to open it, but hold it and do not take it. I'm gonna ask you to stand. And the worship team is gonna lead us in a song. And here's what I'm gonna ask. As you hold the communion as we worship and we sing, I wanna ask you to reflect on the unconditional love of God and the unselfish love of God and the unfailing love of God. And if you choose to take it with us today in remembrance, in the middle of the song, I'm gonna come back up And we'll all remember the body and the blood of Christ. Let us worship.